Phantom's recent announcement about the Sonic upgrade has taken the market by stir. In order to dig under the bonnet and understand truly what does this mean for Phantom and the ecosystem, I've been lucky enough to bring on Michael Kong to answer your very questions. Michael, let's bring you straight on here and get straight into the content. How are you, buddy? Going well, thanks. Yeah, how are you going? Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad at all. We read your blog post. We saw your announcement. The community is really excited. But as you could imagine, there are a lot of questions, right? There's a lot of questions about, you know, you referred to Sonic as being the new best in class shared sequencer for L1 and L2 chains, right? But what does it mean? Like, how are you thinking about Sonic internally? Let's get let's start off straight with that. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think a lot of feedback from the community is that, they were a bit confused about what exactly um, we've announced, like in terms of the technology or the new product coming out. Um, and I think definitely going forward, we need to clarify exactly what we're building. So, you know, thanks for the opportunity for me to clarify it. So essentially what we're building is what's more closely aligned with an L2, right? So we're taking the Sonic technology and we're using it to build essentially a bridge or a, what's known as a sequencer um, to use the L2 parlance. And we're connecting that initially to Ethereum, which means that we're allowed, allowing people to bridge natively or directly from Ethereum to the new Sonic network and, and, and bridge back as well, right? And why we call it like a decentralized sequencer or first-in-class sequencer is that unlike the um, other so-called L2 technologies out there or sequencer technologies, they're, they're, they're really run in a very centralized manner where it's just one team or one database that is writing back and forth or bridging back and forth to Ethereum. What we've done is that we've already had this existing technology that's fully developed called Sonic that allows us or the community to run validators to verify the transactions going to and from Ethereum. And this means that um, you know you have benefits of decentralization, you have benefits of additional security, you have benefits of um, being able to earn uh, fees as a, um, a, as a token holder, uh, staking and verifying transactions, not just on the new Sonic chain, but also in terms of this bridging as well. Um, so there's increased utility for uh, the token, which isn't available for um, other L2s out there, where they just use the token as sort of like um, a governance mechanism, and, and that's about it. So what we're building, just to summarize, is more closely aligned with an L2, but a much, much faster and better and more secure L2 out there with the benefit of the scalability of the Sonic technology and um, a, lo a lot better economics, I think, as well. Okay, so thank you for explaining that, Michael. So then, and just as a caveat for everybody watching, I'm going to try to make this, along with Michael, as simple as possible, right? We don't want to dig into the technicalities of everything here. If, we, if you guys do want a deeper dive into some of the technical aspects and you want to see that, let me know in the comments. We can always set up another one. Michael, Michael's uh, graciously agreed that we can, can set up a separate deep dive. This is meant to just kind of understand what does it mean in lay terms? Like, what does it actually mean for you day to day? So, okay, that makes sense. So it's, you're kind of thinking of it as a layer two. So that the natural question that the community are going to be asking then is, what does that mean for the current L1 Phantom in terms of the Opera network? Like, is that still a focus? Will it still be running? If you can talk to that a bit. Yeah, so the Opera network will still be running, at least for um, a couple of years. There will be a one-to-one -one token swap from the current um opera network the fdm token to a new token on the other network um that will also be done using the bridge sonic technology that i talked about um and we're pretty easy to do it would just be like interacting with any other bridge like interface and you'll be able to bridge um back and forth so um if someone wants to you know use um the existing opera network if someone wants to you know trade the token they'll be able to do it um either using the new token or the existing token. So, so um, yeah. does that, my, sorry, sorry to start, Michael, does that mean therefore that the new tokenomics for the new token will be matched to the current phantom tokenomics? Will they be the same? Um, the tokenomics will be a bit different. There'll be more information coming out, okay. but it will be pretty similar in terms of, you know, token functionality. In fact, the token functionality, is, as I just mentioned, um, will we'll have, uh, the token will have a lot more functionality than, existing tokens uh, th then tokens for existing l2s right 
um, because, for example, with like Optimism and Arbitrum, you can only use their token um, for you know governance voting, right? There, there isn't any more utility to it than that. Whereas for us, because you can participate in the the security of of the L2, you can earn transaction fees there. You can participate in governance on the network, and also I think crucially, you'll be able to earn a lot of fees as a protocol um, based on the amount of transactions that you generate for the network. So you have this additional fee layer that we call gas monetization, and that's not really possible um, on 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 other L2s that are out there. Which I can get into a lot more detail on, I guess. No, that makes complete sense. And so I guess the question really, which I want to kind of delve into personally is, where's the team's focus then? So you've got this opera network, this layer one, which, you know, you guys have been building for many, I think December 2019, correct me wrong, if, when the main net went live. And now you've got Sonic as an upgrade. Like, are there two separate teams that are working on the two separate projects? Will you continue to focus on getting dApps to build on the layer one? Or where's the priority of the foundation right now between the two? How's, how's that being thought about? Um, the team is very much like focused on Sonic. So the existing network is very stable. It's been stable for um, since we launched in December 2019, as you mentioned. Um, the, the, the original vision of Sonic was basically significantly upgrading the existing Opera network, right? So in a sense, creating like a better L1 uh, to, to make it you know a lot more scalable, et cetera, as I've previously like outlined in like many different presentations and, and talks that I've given. Um, the reason why we decided to go more broadly is because I think we, we determined internally that the use of the Sonic network goes beyond just making a better L1. It can be applied across um, uh, a much broader scope of technology, right? In other words, yes, it can be used um, to create a better L1, but it can also be used to solve um, some critical problems that exist for L2 technology. And there's a big opportunity with um, uh, uh, tapping into the Ethereum uh, ecosystem because there's enormous amounts of liquidity, there's enormous amounts of users, and they want like a more scalable network that they can have maximum benefit from. And we believe that we've also solved that problem when we've, when we've analyzed the problem, with the existing Sonic technology that's adapted to work as uh, as a bit of a bridge, right? So for us, the opportunity we think is a lot bigger than we initially thought, which is why we're kind of going down this route. Because in the end, like what we are interested in at the foundation is basically growing and developing um, the ecosystem and the community as much as possible, right? And we believe that you know going down this new route that we've uh, thought about carefully in the longer run will give us a much bigger community and and, and assets on the management and DeFi activity and, and all that stuff um, uh, that, that we want in the end. So if I'm not mistaken, then, do you at some point envisage um, phasing out the Opera network and therefore not having a layer one, just solely being a layer two for Ethereum? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I mean, uh, our, our idea is to uh, eventually like upgrade the Opera network to also be um uh the, the the original like sonic l1 that we envision <laughs> um that's actually like available and ready to go the reason why we haven't pulled the trigger on the full main upgrade at the moment is because we're just uh we're mainly focused on this um uh new technology um or not new technology but this new direction that we're going applying the exist existing sonic technology right this this l2 play more closely aligned as i just mentioned right um but over time yeah, like the, the 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 incentives, the the focus, the the progress will be more closely aligned with with the L two um, rather than the L one, because again, that's where we think that the much bigger opportunity actually exists. I mean, when you look at the numbers in terms of the the amount of assets on L twos, right? So Ethereum plus L two, it just blows all the other um, chains out of the water, right? Um, and for us, it's like looking at okay. Where, where's the biggest pie, right? It's like, yes, uh, uh, working as an existing L1, um, we could, you know, get some sort of like share of pie of the pie in terms of like users and assets under money management, etc. But if we go down the L2 route, the pie is much, much bigger. And we have the opportunity to get a much bigger slice by solving a problem that um, hasn't actually really been solved at the moment, which is how do you actually create a community run um, L2, because the existing L2s out there, as Vitalik recently talked about, um, don't come anywhere close to actually offering like a secure L2. And they're always um, one mistake 
away from like an absolute disaster and like an absolute disaster hasn't happened yet um but but it could um for example um there are many l2s out there that don't write any what are known as fraud proofs back to ethereum in other words there's no way to verify that the data written back to ethereum is actually the sequence of transactions that have taken place on on the l2 so if the l2 were ever going to go down and you have to verify the transactions that took place you can never be certain that those transactions actually took place by looking at at the l1 so they have no of the security properties of of of, of ethereum perfect and for the for those that are slightly newer to crypto i mean of course we're in the midst of the early stages of a new bull market there's a new person entering crypto every single day and maybe stumbling across this video and phantom for the first time they might not know what a layer 2 solution is they maybe figured out what ethereum is and what a layer 1 is just very quickly like 30 40 seconds just how do you you know picture what a layer 2 is if you if somebody asks you what is a layer 2 how do you explain that to them so a layer 2 is a chain that has its um, security rooted in an L1. So what I mean by that is that you have the L1 and you have an L2 that sits on top of it and um, assets can be moved back and forth between the L1 and the L2 via um, a bridge or what's what's uh, also known as a sequencer. And the L2, the transactions that are performed on the L2 are written, um, uh, are, are, are put together in and written back to the L1 in terms of being able to prove that, you know, the sequence of transactions that occurred on the L2 actually occurred on the L1. So that's where um, the term rooted in L1 security comes from, if you if you do it correctly. Got it. And again, to, just to help people understand the picture, why would it be that if you're Ethereum, which is the L1 you're going to be building an L2 on top of, why do people look for L2s? What's the pain point that, that we have the likes of Polygon, Matic, we, the likes that we have Opt Optimism, Arbitrum, and now obviously Sonic as well? Like, why do they exist? What problem are they solving uh, due to Ethereum's kind of weaknesses? They're the, the solving for the lack of scalability. So the, the problem with Ethereum's architecture is that it's not scalable at all, right? And that means that they can only process a limited number of transactions per second which means that um, when there's a lot of demand for the network, there's not much like processing capability, right? And that means that in terms of supply and demand, the price of submitting a transaction to the network goes up and the price of the transaction goes up prohibitively expensive to the vast majority of people out there. Um, if you're moving like millions of dollars around or you're doing millions of dollars worth of transactions, um, you know, paying a transaction fee of, you know, maybe $50 or $100 if you're doing a, particular smart contract um, transaction, um, that, that's probably not going to be prohibited. But if you're like an average retail user and you're you know, moving around $1,000 or you're, you're doing a, a smart, you're interacting with a smart contract and you're depositing or withdrawing $1,000 and your transaction fee is like $50 or $100, you know, that's five or 10% of your portfolio in a single transaction. And that means that it's not really possible for you to economically use um, Ethereum. And so like Ethereum's transaction capability, I can't remember the, the latest numbers, but, you know, it's definitely like way under 100. I think it you know, might be like 20 or so. <laughs> and um, that means that when, you know, there's huge demand for the network, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or even like millions that we want to get to. And you can only process 20 transactions per second. Um, the transactions get really expensive. So what L2 has promised to do is that, hey, you can still use um, you can still get the benefits of the security of using Ethereum, but you can use this chain that sits on top of it that where you can process your transaction. And because the network is architected differently and it's like currently like more centralized, then you you can actually execute your transaction faster and, and cheaper than if you would do it on Ethereum. But um, because the security is rooted in Ethereum, apparently, that means that your transactions, when they're confirmed, should be confirmed with the same security properties as exists on Ethereum. So that's sort of the promise that's given out there, but that's not what really exists at the moment in, in this space. Now, I think we can get there in the end, for example, using the Sonic technology, but right now, that's not where we're, we're really at, but that's the overall promise of, of, of an L2. It, essentially, it's using Ethereum, but cheaper and faster with just the same sec uh, security properties. Makes complete sense. And so that then brings us on to look that clearly 
you've done the maths, you've done the calculus to say the Pi is bigger building a, a layer two on Ethereum. But with that comes a lot of competition, right? You've got the likes of Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum. You touched upon it briefly a little bit more, but just to give you a chance to elaborate, how do you think or how will Sonic be better than those competitors to stand out? Because there's some already big, strong, well-funded, uh, you know, layer two projects that have been around for quite a while now. Yeah, well, there's also a lot of competitions with existing layer ones, right? Like obviously Solana is the biggest that's out there by far uh, in terms of market cap. You've got Avalanche, you've got others that are starting to emerge like Sui and Say and, and a whole bunch of others. So the competition is very fierce when it comes to L1s and also when it comes to L2s as well. Um, you know, th there's a lot more competition than, um, uh, th than when Phantom first launched back in 2019 or in... Uh, a previous cycle was like in 2021, right? So um, uh, in terms of competition with L2s, I mean, the way that we compete is focusing on both like business development and the technology, right? So just to elaborate again on the technology, as I mentioned before, with the Sonic technology, we can process over 200, uh, we can process over 2000 like heavy duty smart contract um, uh, transactions per second, right? Now, I know other people out there say, oh, but what about this chain or that chain that promises 10,000 or so? Well, that's unproven. That's all, at the very least, theoretical or just not even not even that, right? Whereas Do we know what the equivalent number is? Do we know what the equivalent number is, like proven for the likes of Polygon or for the likes of Optimism Arbitrum? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if you go to like the L2Beats website or some other sources, um, people say that the true... Um, TPS for some of these um, networks is probably around 100 or so, right? And um, I, I saw someone do some analysis saying that, you know, if you're talking about L1s, that Solana does about like 1,000 TPS, right? Now, uh, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I, um, that, I, that I've proven that or that's my claim. I'm just saying that that's like some of the talk that's going around, right? Yep. So yep. I think with Sonic, what's different from a lot of these claims that uh, are being made of like vastly better performance is that we've actually proven it and we're transparent about it because we've got test nets that are out there where people can see all of the data going in there, all of the transactions being processed, exactly what kind of transactions are being processed, how the blocks are formed, et cetera. And so, you know, we invite anyone to go in there and to scrutinize the data and to see, you know, whether or not we are actually um, being able to process 2,000, you know, um, smart contract transactions per second because we absolutely are. And, you know, if people disagree with that um they can try and they, they can they can argue and say our data is wrong and so has that evidence and data been put out has that been put out publicly already for people to look at yeah i mean it's been put out there since um late october 2023 um Great. so we have a te test net at sonic.phantom.network that shows all the data and shows it's basically a block explorer and anyone can also publicly interact with um, that network and, and gather the data for, for themselves if they wanted to verify that what we're displaying on the Explorer page is, is actually accurate. Um, but yeah, just long story short, I think we solve a lot of the scalability, scalability um, issues with existing L2s, which means that our fees can be significantly lower. Even though the fees of current L2s are definitely a lot lower on average than compared to Ethereum, they still kind of spike up sometimes, you know, a dollar or two dollars, even more than that, because they too, um, uh, reach like maximum capacity. Um, so we solve for that. We also solve for the problem of um, not not having a centralized sequencer anymore. And so, you know, as I talked about before, a lot of the bridges or the sequences from these L2s to, to Ethereum are very much centralized and are run by a single team or, or single database. Um, we solve that because we can use the Sonic technology to actually have a validator set that verifies the transactions going to and from the bridge which means that you have like increased security because it's not the foundation that's running it. It's like the community as a whole, pretty much in the same way that the community currently validates um, the transactions on the existing Opera network. And how does the block finality compare to some of the L2 competitors? Yeah, so the block finality at the moment is about 0.8 seconds and falling. So um, that means that when you submit a transaction to the network, <laughs> on average, it should be confirmed by two thirds of the validating power or fully confirmed and, and finalized into a block on the network in about 0 0.8 seconds. And so 
that um that same speed because it's based on the same technology um will also exist on this like new l2 and when mm -hmm. you look at the existing l2s um they take um several seconds on average so our confirmation any, any ethereum, a lot any, any ethereum for reference so for, for ethereum um the time to finality or the confirmation times is about 60 seconds right and and pe but people may rip my um but people might say oh but blocks on average get mined or, or not mined but, but they get ver are verified every 12 seconds right so why am i saying 60 seconds well it's because um the finality on ethereum is what's known as probabilistic rather than deterministic right so when i say like 0 0.8 seconds for sonic i mean that's 40 confirmed and irreversible right if your transaction gets included into the into one block in Ethereum, that's not necessarily secure because it's possible for the block to uh, for the chain to reorg, for another part of the chain to become the this is a little technical but becoming like a a, a, lo a longer chain, and then your transaction is not necessarily included into the final um, Ethereum uh, chain, right? And so the rule of thumb is that you, you have to wait for several blocks after it, and that maybe about four or five blocks which means that it's more like 60 seconds to really make sure that your transaction is going to be part of the existing ethereum network i mean even if you wanted to argue 12 the point point which point we're trying to make here is you're talking 0.8 seconds versus 12 seconds um and what, what did you say the number is roughly for like optimism arbitrum do we know polygon are they still in the um, seconds multiple seconds yeah yeah they, they would that would be in the multiple seconds yeah fine so we're talking a decent order of magnitude, I guess, uh, faster because you're, you're sub-second, right? And they're not, they, they've not got to that point where they've delivered sub-second finality. So to summarize, you're talking better throughput, better block finality, and hopefully cheaper fees. When you say cheaper fees, again, do you think you'll be able to achieve like a, a order of magnitude cheaper? Or do you think it'll be competitive with the likes of Polygon, Optimism, Optrum? So like kind of our long-term objective is that you want to... Um, you want to maximize fees for the network, right? But you want to do it in such a way that the average fee per user is very, very low, right? So you want to have um, low transaction fees per user, an enormous amount of transactions, which translates to an enormous amount of fees for the validators on, on the network, right? So for us, um, we can process up to about 180 million daily transactions before the performance starts to deteriorate. So our objective is, yes, to maintain as low fees as possible, and but still be able to reward validators um, via transaction fees in the long term by having a lot of um, users using the network as many transactions to the network. So yes, fee fees will be quite a lot lower than existing L2s. Sorry. Um, fees will be a lot lower than existing L2s and um, we can achieve that because the network is a lot more scalable. Got it. Okay, so hopefully that gives everybody a good idea of of kind of what yourself and the foundation are thinking to do in terms of Sonic. Now, can you talk to dates? Like, what what sort of timeframes are we talking about? I think that's one of the most common questions I'm getting over the last kind of twenty four hours is when when are you ready to launch? Uh, and what can we you know what can we expect on launch day and slash what do we need to do? Like, when can we exchange the tokens, for example, to the new token? Yeah, so they'll be they'll be ready, you know, not like years away, but just a few months away. So within a few months, um, we should have um, a lot of this technology developed and launched, or at least like the first version. So it's not that it's not that far away, in my opinion. Um, there will be a lot more technical detail coming out um, from the technical team that are working very very hard on this, like fully explaining in more technical detail everything that I just kind of talked about. So it's not um, that far away because keep in mind that. As I mentioned before, um, the, the the existing Sonic um, technology is already fully built. So what are we working on now? We're working on, on adapting it to work for a uh, for a bridge to Ethereum, essentially. And so, so that almost requires what, a little bit more work. Say, so we're almost yeah. there. So almost what you're trying to say is like the technology was built as ready. We were going to launch it as a layer one. We just need an extra couple of months just to make sure that we've pivoted across to having a, a, an L2. That's exactly correct. Got it. The other bit I wanted to kind of uh, ask about was you're, you're very careful in terms of saying 
that it's a shared sequencer versus a bridge or a side chain. Can you help the average person just understand why you're using that? What like what you mean by that versus just you know generically saying an L two? So um, the the term shared sequencer is a bit technical, and I think in in the in my letter in retrospect, I sort of use a more simple term or more fully explain what we mean by a shared sequencer. Essentially, what it is is like. To put to put it in very loose terms, it's like a it's like a decentralized bridge, right? So as I mentioned before on on this interview, right now when you've got these bridges from like an L1 like Ethereum to an L2 and back and forth, the transactions are verified, um, not by um, a, a, a whole bunch of different nodes run by the community. They're they're verified by like a centralized entity, right? And the transactions that are confirmed on these L2s are also not verified by um, a, a, a whole bunch of like community members, right? <laughs> They're verified by um, a centralized entity or centralized um, uh, a database, right? And then those results are sent to Ethereum um, in order um, in order for it to be you know included in the Ethereum network. But you have to trust that um, the 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 bridge or the sequencer is actually writing the correct data in the right order. In other words, you have to trust that you know, the centralized entity is actually reporting the data correctly. So what we mean by the term um, shared is more like decentralized, right? In that the, the the sequence or the writing of data to Ethereum or the bridging to Ethereum is confirmed by multiple nodes in the network, not just like one centralized entity. So that's what this term is sent, the, um, uh, shared sequence actually means. Um, so I hope that clarifies a lot of this like technical jargon that's been going around. Got it. Okay. Um, so we're talking, you know, a couple of months, like you've said, will the token be ready at the same time? Will that, will that be part of the launch altogether with the new token? Yes, that's correct. Actually, like creating a new token is, is pretty easy um, uh, to do. So that's not really a technical roadblock um, at all whatsoever. We can see from all the meme coins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. the, it must be easy. <laughs> I guess I guess the main thing on people's mind is they're sat there on Phantom and the question they're going to be asking is, you know, where where if I'm invested in Phantom and I believe in what the foundation is doing, do I hold my Phantom token or do I hold the new token that's going to come up? Do we have a ticker for this new token yet? Um internally with our comment with a ticker, but we'll release that. Okay. Um, in due course, there'll be one that's uh, very like memeable and um, and I, I, I think quite interesting. But um, we're, uh, to answer your specific question, um, yes, holding the FTM token allows you to get access to the new network. As I as we talked about before, um, there'll be a one to one swap from the new network going back and forth. So if you believe in the Phantom project or you believe in in Sonic and and us in general, um, yeah, if you hold the Phantom token. Um, that's not going to go to waste at all. Um, that will be completely usable on the existing Opera network. It will be usable one to one on the new um, chain. Um, yeah, got it. And will there be a window for which it's one to one redeemable, and then that stopped? I'm assuming it's not going to be indefinite. Um, there, there, there won't be any like limited window at this point in time. So people can swap um, back and forth um, as they want. So for example. Um, if someone wants to swap from Ethereum to the new token, um, but then they want to um, buy or sell the um, FTM token on an exchange that doesn't support the new token yet, they can move back to um, uh, the FTM token and then, you know, d d deposit or withdraw that accordingly to an exchange. But I'm trying to understand that because Phantom and this new token can't be pegged one to one forever, right? They have different tokenomics and different setups and market cap, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, that's correct. Um, which is why, like, um, uh, a one-to-one -one bridge, like, is not likely to is exist forever. But Got for it. like the foreseeable future, um, it will be. But obviously, okay. with the new token, we will want to get that, um, you know, adopted in terms of, um, you know, exchanges and just different um, um, uh, environments out there. Got it. Okay. And is the consensus mechanism going to be the same? Are there any changes in consensus mechanism on the new chain? Um, no, the consensus mechanism will be um, pretty much the same. And that is like a big difference compared to the existing L2s. The existing L2s, you know, don't have a community run validator set uh, verifying the transactions 
whereas like we will, uh, which means that if you hold uh, the new token, it's not just going to be used for governance. It can be used for, you know, earning rewards for um, validating net, uh, transactions in the network, paying for transaction fees, participating in governance, pretty much the same functionality that you have on the existing FTM token you will have for the new network as well. So is there not a risk then that when the new chain is spun up, existing phantom validators, some of the big guys, decide to, I don't want to validate for the Opera network anymore, I want to validate for Sonic, and therefore we start losing uh, some of the decentralization on Opera. Is that a possibility? Um, that is expected because the um, in, in, in the incentives and the opportunities will be more so on the L2. Um, what we will do for the existing Opera network is that the foundation will maintain nodes there for an indefinite period of time because it's important for security reasons, right? Um, mm -hmm. In terms of like the largest token holders on Phantom, you know, as I pointed out in my letter, when we were thinking about uh, uh, making uh, th this pivot or, or, or changing direction a bit, we, we wanted to do it obviously with the support of a lot of people in the community, particularly like the, the bigger token holders. So, you know, I personally had meetings with a lot of different projects and a lot of different token holders on the Phantom ecosystem. And I asked them, hey, this is an idea that we're thinking of exploring. This is where I think the opportunity is. This is all also, there are also some risks, obviously, going in this direction. You know, nothing is risk-free uh, or potential disadvantages. What are your thoughts about it? And overwhelmingly, um, the existing apps on Phantom and the biggest token holders were very, very supportive of the di new direction that we're going for. Fundamentally, because they see it as like a much bigger opportunity than just creating a better L1. Because they were saying, look, if, if, if we continue with the current trajectory and we launch Sonic just for the existing um, offer network, so it becomes the Sonic network, um, it could just be seen as a better L1, which is great. But then people may ask, what's next? You know, what, what about additional functionality? And they thought that the opportunity that we're going for right now is a far bigger one that can gain a lot more users, particularly coming from Ethereum. And so because the feedback was very positive with some constructive feedback in it as well, um, we were like, okay, we have the clear support from a lot of token holders on Phantom, the biggest ones. We have a lot of support from the key um, projects on Phantom as well. We think that this is a, a good direction to go in because obviously if the community didn't support it, our you know, biggest token holders and projects were, were just like flatly against it or had some really, really like valid criticism where they're just like, we think this is just going to be a bad idea we definitely would not have gone in that direction because in the end we're building for the community. And so if the community wants something, you know, we should try and deliver for it. And they want us to actually like make this change because they see the opportunity has just been a lot bigger. Got it. And so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming the likes of, you know, Beethoven X, the likes of Equalizer and some of these larger TVL projects on Phantom from the previous cycle, that they'd be looking to port straight across to Sonic so people have some use cases ready there for when launch is there? Or will there be a, a period where Sonic could be launched, but there's nothing you can do on it for a couple of months, is, which, which is the case? So when we launch the new network, it will be fully with EVM compatible, right? So you'll be able to go there and deploy your smart contract and deploy your project. Um, yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through a list of like like names or whatever, but like, yeah, the, 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 the bigger, the, the more prominent, well-known, uh, projects on Phantom have already committed to moving to the new network and not just like existing projects um, on Phantom, right? <laughs> but also major DeFi projects that are not currently on Phantom that do want to come into our ecosystem. So for example, just um, a couple of days ago, we announced that on um, Frax Finance, which is one of the biggest DeFi projects on Ethereum and elsewhere with a total value locked over $1.6 billion, they not only invested in this new network, but they're committed into deploying, as um, Sam, the founder said, from day one on the new network. So from day one, they want to be there deploying all the Frax assets that they have. And so that's a major DeFi project that's not currently on Phantom that will be for the new network. And I think that's incredibly good news. And and that's not and that's not just going to be the only DeFi project. There are many big other projects out there that are looking to come to the new network because they see it as like a refreshed opportunity um, for the network to get very, very big. Um, so Frax Finance is just one example of that. And there are others down the line and quite a few other in uh, investors that are very well known to people that uh, are coming on board with the new vision as well that I think a lot of people in the community will like.
And just again, for the for the lay person to understand, given the EVM compatibility for a DAP developer, I'm assuming it's very little work for them to go, hang on, I'm on Polygon, I'm on Optimism, I'm on Arbitrum, I might as well spin up on Sonic as well. Is that the case? Yeah, that's correct. So even though we have a new virtual machine that we call the Phantom Virtual Machine, it will be, it, well, it is like um 100% Solidity compatible. So in other words, like the way that you would write and deploy a smart contract, say on like Polygon or Ethereum or other what are known as EVM compatible chain chains or Ethereum virtual machine compatible chains um, will pretty much work the same way as on Sonic. Now you might have to run like a few different commands, but that's more like copy and paste work um, to deploy mm -hmm. it. But essentially your code will run in exactly the same way, just with a lot better performance. So if, again, I'm just trying to picture this for for you know uh, the average person. A, a DAP developer decides to put some hard work into building their DAP. They always plan to launch on Arbitrum. They've gone and done that piece of work, and they go, "Hang on a second. For very little more work, I can take a risk on Sonic, launch it there, and who knows? Within some time, they notice that they're doing much more in transactions or and TVL on Sonic than they are on Arbitrum. It's a possibility that they can, even without necessarily having experience with Sonic, they they may as well give it a shot because it's not that much more. Uh, effort or work to deploy on on two places, two networks. Yeah. Okay. That's so, exactly right. uh, perfect. So you touched upon the the Frax uh, announcement. Thank. I was going to bring that up. So thank you very much for touching that. But I also want to touch upon the the bullet point you spoke to in your letter around simplified staking and obviously the LST liquid staking token narrative. Do you just want to talk to that a little bit? Elaborate on that point. Yeah. So this is one of the big opportunities for the um, ecosystem. Um, originally, when we designed um, the uh, staking system for Phantom, we were trying to be, I think, a little too clever in retrospect, right? We wanted to have this um, system that encouraged people to lock up for longer, right? Um, to show their commitment to um, security of the Phantom network. And so we had this system, or we have this system right now, where if you lock from anywhere from two weeks to 365 days or two weeks to a year, um, you can, um, um, you, 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 the, the percentage of rewards that you get more like scale up linearly, right? And so, you know, it, it conceptually, so, like, it may seem like. Sorry, Michael. Just I can just so I can clarify for the people. So, essentially, if you go onto the Phantom website, the current way you natively stake Phantom, there's a slider. You slide like this is how much I want to stake for. I want to lock up my tokens for X number of days, and the more you're willing to lock it up, you would get a higher APY. That's what you're referring to as yeah. the current. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and if you weren't going to like lock up at all there's a, like a seven day withdrawal period but you earn the minimal rewards compared to that if you locked up right now now conceptually like what we why we thought this was a good idea was because oh this will encourage people to stake for longer which means a uh, better security right but it turned out not necessarily to be the case right and in particular when it came to liquid staking tokens which is a huge huge opportunity in DeFi, right uh for like pretty obvious reasons um liquid staking providers were not really willing to deploy on phantom because of this unique setup that we had in terms of staking compared to other networks so other networks out there have a much more simple staking period where you earn like one rate no matter um how much you, you stake right you're in one like um proportional rate or percentage rate and you have an onboarding period of anywhere from like 21 to 28 days right i.e like a withdrawal period and that's how they main secure, maintain security in the network uh, the problem that LSTs had is that in order to get the high APR, they had to take on a, a much more risk, right? Because liquid staking tokens, as is implied in the, in the name, are supposed to be liquid. And it's supposed to be like also redeemable as well. But if you're, if the FDM that people deposit in these liquid staking tokens is locked up for a year, <laughs> there's not really much liquidity if they want to withdraw the liquid staking token back to the underlying asset, right? And so we had issues where liquid staking providers were trying to deploy on Phantom and actually did deploy on Phantom. Um, but then the feedback was, oh, I'm sorry, we can't really support it that much because uh, the, uh, the 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 risk with the longer staking period is just too much for us, right, in terms of redemption. Um, because if you don't have enough redemption available, enough liquidity available at any given time, the price of the liquid staking token is likely to go down because you're not able to redeem it immediately one one to one, right? Or, or, or proportionally and so there was always a very limited there was always like a limit to how much like you know liquid staking uh, tokens were available in phantom and so we took that feedback on board and said you know what we should have a staking system for the new network and the existing network 
that is much more aligned with how other chains do it. So that liquid staking providers have already provided the infrastructure for chains that have a very similar staking system. So it doesn't require them that much work to in, to do it for with our new staking mechanism, our much more simplified staking mechanism. <laughs> and it also removes that security issue that I was talking about by having that much longer staking period. And that means that we now have an opportunity where this $1.2 billion or so of staked FTM has the potential to be converted to liquid staking tokens, which means that they can be used in the DeFi ecosystem and boost the total value locked in the network. And that's where an enormous opportunity exists for us because that's exactly what other chains have done, right? A big part of their DeFi activity comes from liquid staking tokens and people uh, doing transactions based on those liquid staking tokens that has a positive effect on the rest of the DeFi ecosystem. And so we need to tap into that. And there's a $1.2 billion opportunity there of, of a staked FTM currently, approximately. And so that can be an enormous benefit to um, uh, to the network in terms of its activity going forward. Yep. Okay. Noted. I'm personally not a big fan of LSTs. I feel like they're a house of cards, but uh, I understand your kind of perspective and how all chains are using them in terms of uh, being a big opportunity in the market. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, okay. So we understand the staking. We understand the LSTs. Will there be a way still for people to bridge from, I don't know, if somebody wanted to bridge from Avalanche to Sonic, how would, how would they do something like that? Would they have to go via Ethereum? Yeah, so with the first release, um, we're, we're constructing the bridge um, from Ethereum to the new chain, right? Or, or the yeah. shared sequencer, as we talked about before. Um, with regards to like um, uh, bridging from other chains, you know, such as Avalanche you mentioned or others out there, um, I think that's better done with like third party bridges that will be um, uh, deploying on uh, with, with the new chain. So um, those third party bridges already exist to you know, bridge assets between different chains that are not necessarily Ethereum. They would, I think, likely do the same thing with the new network as well. But we want to want to establish like a sequencer that's or, or a bridge ourselves that's necessarily going from you know us to many other chains out there. One because it's an enormous amount of work. And two, um, you know, we the, the security um, needs in the end be rooted on Ethereum. It doesn't make sense for you know the security to be rooted on Ethereum and some other chain that's out there as well. It's just like not really compatible. Yeah, and so I guess one of the kind of questions some may have is, what is Ethereum's roadmap? Right, if you're tying your mast mast to this ship that is Ethereum, and by building an L two you you very uh, intimately tie your future to Ethereum's. Where's that ship sailing? What's Vitalik's plan and how does that now impact Phantom? It'll, be, it'll become a big part of you and the foundation strategy. And so, you know, for example, with ETH 2.0, there was a big fear at the time. I remember when I was making videos uh, that people were scared that there would be no need for layer twos, right? I mean, obviously they were wrong, but they were saying that there will be no need for layer twos after ETH 2.0, that they're going to become scalable. They're going to figure things out themselves at some point. And then where does that leave layer twos? Does that ever come into your thinking? And, and kind of what are your thoughts around that? Or do you think layer twos are just here to stay? It's just going to be part of uh, the ecosystem. Yeah, they're going to be here to stay because it's impossible, in my opinion, for Ethereum to be scalable enough to handle hundreds of millions of transactions on a daily basis, right? And the reason I say hundreds of millions of transactions, right, is that if we want to get worldwide adoption, that's how many transactions in the network we, we need to be able to handle, right? And Ethereum comes nowhere near that number, right? Even at just like um, a couple of million transactions on a daily basis for Ethereum, people are already paying prohib prohibitively expensive transaction fees, right? Even just sending like ether costs can, uh, ETH across from one address to another can cost several dollars, right? Um, but just um, to address one of your comments saying that, you know, we're tying our mask to Ethereum, that's not really so, right? Um, so the, the way that this new chain that we're developing on Phantom will work is that you, you write um, the data back to Ethereum in order to prove that, um, you know, it's verifiable on an external network, i.e. Ethereum. And so Ethereum recently released uh, uh, the Deacon upgrade, which contains this blob data structure, which appears to make writing back to Ethereum uh, quite a bit cheaper than it is um, uh, than it was before. Although e even that is like having scalability issues right now. And so, you know, I envision that Ethereum is basically just going to try and make it easier for other chains to route their security 
in Ethereum because Ethereum is a very, very secure network. That's the real benefit that they have, right? They have many different nodes. They have a very big community. Security is not really an issue for Ethereum. It's more like the scalability. And looking at what um, Vitalik and others have been talking about, yes, initially, a few years ago, I remember, you know, they were talking about how they would have, you know, L1 um, uh, solutions to increase Ethereum scalability, had all these ideas about sharding, et cetera. But now the talk is really about, okay, how do we make it basically as easy and convenient and secure as possible for these other chains, these L2s, to basically um, be able to interact with the Ethereum network and to build upon it. So I think the direction of the Ethereum Foundation is really about growing and supporting L2s and improving their security um, rather than, okay, L2s are going to be redundant in the future. Let's just, you know, make the current Ethereum network infinitely scalable. Because as I mentioned before, I think that's basically impossible at this stage because you would have to fundamentally change the underlying architecture of Ethereum, which means that you would have to get basically everyone to dramatically change like the way that um, the Ethereum client works. And that's just has enormous amount of risks. That That's the problem when your network is big is that it's harder to make changes to the underlying technology. It just becomes a lot riskier. Yeah, it's like changing an engine whilst flying at 30,000 feet, as the analogy says. So, okay, so just again, playing dev devil's advocate, is there a way technically that in the future, let's say Ethereum has a disaster next five years, Solana has flippened Ethereum, and for argument's sake, if Sonic wanted to now be the layer two, which writes down into Solana, is that possible? Is that what we're saying? That Sonic is almost standalone. We can write down to any layer one, which we choose um, at the time. Is that the way it works almost? Or no, you can't, you are tying yourself to Ethereum. Uh, um, we'd have to look uh, more at the specifics of like how Solana is implemented in this context. But in general, um, the answer is like, yes, it would be possible. It's not just like, um, uh, I, I, um, our, our new technology is not something that is, you know, dependent on Ethereum. Um, it is a standalone chain. It just writes yeah. um, data back to Ethereum, right? Which means that we could write data theoretically to any other chain or any other blockchain, or even like a, a layer two, if you wanted to become a layer three. Although just to be clear, we have no plans for that like whatsoever at this point in time. Um, so if, for example, like Ethereum were to like go down, right? Or, or some other chain that we're interacting with would go down. What would happen to the Sonic chain? The the answer is is that the Sonic chain would continue to run as normal. It will continue to verify transactions on its network as normal. Obviously, you know the ability to write to Ethereum would no longer exist, and the bridge um, would no longer be working from Ethereum to the Sonic network. But the chain would continue to operate uh, um, as per usual. So, you know, it, it's not like um, the, the Ethereum, you know, must stay up forever or must behave in a particular way for us to work. It's more like we have our own technology that's run by its own validator set. And if Ethereum happens to go down, which is not ideal, obviously, um, the network would still be able to like run um, independently. Got it. And again, just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, if Ethereum went down, would, there would still be the layer one aspect that still operates natively within Sonic as well, or is that not correct? Um, that is correct. Got it. Cool. Okay, perfect. I think that we can park that bit there. I mean, we'll skip past kind of like grant programs and reward programs, although I do want to touch upon the airdrops. I know some of the team have kind of alluded to the fact that there could be some airdrops to reward not only current Opera users, but also to thank new users on the new Sonic chain as well. Can you add any more flavor to that? Yes. So it's not could there will be so there will be there an airdrop breaking news guys existing. breaking news yeah so there will be airdrops to reward existing um opera users <laughs> there will also be several airdrops planned for the new chain as well in particular when it launches from day one and with the um with the airdrop uh, uh program there will be an interface there will be points there will be gamification there will be the ability to see um, where, where your standing is with regards to the airdrop, just like how it um, has operated for a few other chains out there. So we're right now finalizing um, the details and, and the deals with a few third party providers to get an interface developed. And so over the next few months, there will be an interface that people can interact with with the new chain 
and with the existing Opera network. And so essentially, the more you interact with the network, the likely you are to to qualify for, for an airdrop. Nice, nice. And and as and when that's uh, launched, Michael, feel free to jump on and we can maybe do a separate kind of a short episode on how people can actually, you know, do transactions to to become uh, eligible for those as well. That'd be useful for people. Um, okay, let's now move on to talking about VCs. VCs. So you mentioned that there's going to be some more announcements around VCs. Can I tease you for any kind of updates? Is there anything you can share around that? I guess the other question I had around VCs was, look, Andre, a couple of months, or was it last year, spoke about the fact that Phantom's got plenty of runway, right? 30 to 40 years of runway at the current expenditure. If that's the case, why are you bringing on VCs? Is it more strategic? Is it for cash? What are we talking? Yeah, it's definitely from, it's definitely more strategic. So the point of us uh, getting VCs on board is not necessarily because we need more capital to run, right? Um, we, we, we don't very fortunately. Um, we're, we're in a pretty good financial situation. Uh, but VCs don't just provide you with cash uh, or investment. They provide you with the ability to open doors. They provide you with branding. Um, we've studied um, carefully how VCs have worked with other chains that are out there. And we've seen the, the value that it can add there. And it's it's um, very positive. And so for us, what we're doing is that we're finalizing deals with a number of VCs that uh, would be very, very familiar and well-known and, and prominent to um, many communities that are out there. Unfortunately, you know, I can't give names at this point in time until they're actually announced. Um, but we're getting them on board. Um, I, I, unfortunately not because, you know, the, it's under, you know, confidentiality, et cetera, until we're like, we, we uh, announce it. Um, but essentially, like these VD, these VCs are prominent, and they have the ability to open a lot of doors for us in terms of, you know, for example, getting uh, well-known projects on on the new chain. In terms of getting um, a business with Web two or existing companies, and in terms of like many other doors that they can open for us. So definitely, it's very strategic. We want them to have a stake in um, in the in the new network. We want them to be, you know, committed. And, and have our incentives aligned. And so that's why we're going down the VC route. This is a lesson that we learned in the past. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we were kind of like maybe a bit arrogant and said, you know what, we're doing really well. And so, you know, DeFi is taking off. We don't really need VCs. We don't really see the point. You know, we don't need the capital or anything like that. Um, but that was kind of a mistake because we kind of saw VCs as just like someone who writes a check and that's it. But in reality, the good VCs that are out there don't just like write checks. They, you know, interact with the network, and as I already mentioned, they open doors for you. And so that's exactly what um, we're doing now. We're correcting some of the mistakes of the past, um, and I think it'll be very exciting um, because it's not just going to be, you know, the foundation team that is supporting um, the ecosystem. It's going to be the foundation team plus uh, a whole bunch of VCs, plus a whole bunch of angels, plus a whole bunch of different projects that are out there. And I think that's a big difference in how it was in the past, say in twenty twenty one when it really was just the foundation and Andre that was promoting the chain. And honestly, like, I appreciate the the candidness there. And that's for me, of all the announcements made in terms of the amazing tech with Sonic and all the other things we've kind of discussed, like, that's the bit that made me most happy and smile was the fact that, look, because look, you guys have always built great tech. We spoke about it in previous podcasts over the years. Like the tech has always been amazing. And, you know, it's almost no surprise, even though it's amazing what you're doing with Sonic, that the, the, the stats and the numbers you're showing. But to do that piece around the VCs, and I can speak to this from my time in Web2 building software companies, not all VC money is created equally, right? VCs come with expertise, with opening doors, with introducing you to the right people, with strategic board advice and decisions on when to pivot and how to pivot, giving you a broader vision of the market and where the market is heading and the reports they can share and the insights and the data they get access to. Um, it brings a lot. And I think this is going to be a really interesting period for Phantom having some of those uh, some of those people on the team and around you guys to advise as well. So excited for it, excited for the, the kind of the community can help foster. I mean, you've seen with, for example, Solana and the difficult time they've had, their VC community rallied around them and helped them, right? And exactly. uh, that's one of, the, one of the reasons they're able to help propel themselves back up. It's the community you create around it. Not just the, the retail community like you and us, but also the VC community as well. So I was really happy and pleased to kind of to kind of read that piece. Let's move it on to, let's talk about a good friend, Andre Cronier. 
Uh, tell us, how's Andre feeling? We're seeing his tweets. We're seeing his excitement. He's he's checking people on Twitter back. Who's kind of he's putting the naysayers down. How's he feeling right now? What's Andre's focus and what's he actively working on right now? Well, he's, he's very very positive about the you know the direction that we're going and and the and the future of, of Sonic and the ecosystem. Um, what he's doing in the background is you know he's helping us you know advise on or advise the technical team on on the on on, on the technology direction. Was obviously um, Andre is a very very experienced um, software engineer, particularly when it comes to you know uh, crypto and distributed ledger technology. Um, he helps us um, maintain the treasury. You know he's been doing that for years. Um, he um, gives a lot of advice to um, the team members who you talk to him directly. I speak to him, you know, almost every day, maybe once um, every day or, 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 or two days. You know, sorry, uh, you know, I talk to him like almost every day or, or second day. And um, yeah, he's, he's very upbeat and very, very active as people can see on Twitter. But he's always been super active in the background as well. Even when he hasn't been posting that much, he's been working yeah. with us a lot on a lot of different stuff and i think that's uh, not not exactly what people are aware of just because you know it's not something that's like public that's that's out there but you know he's helped with the technology he's helped with you know the treasury management he's helped in terms of direction as well i mean this overall direction uh, where we're going to now actually began with with andre right like andre you know said that you know he thinks that this is the right direction to go he explained it to me he explained all the thinking behind it and initially to be honest i was kind of skeptical so i you know i i i, I responded back to him saying like what about this what about that and he answered my questions and i thought about it a bit more and then i just looked at the data that he mentioned and he was correct and so you know i um ended up agreeing with him and saying you know what andre like i can see it in the data i think this direction is a is a better way for us to go in the long term and so this whole idea about the pivot like really came from him uh to begin with it didn't come from me it, it it came from it came from him so he is like a great visionary and he's someone who's obviously had a very successful track record um not just in in phantom in making it into what it is today when um it probably wouldn't exist without him but obviously also in DeFi, as as, as a lot of people know a lot of people's technologies that they're releasing nowadays that is dealing with you know many billions of dollars um, originally came from his ideas and his his work. Awesome. And I think I can speak on behalf of the community that it's so good to see Andre Cronia feeling positive about the crypto community. We know it can be a very toxic place in the midst of a bear market, but it's so good to see him feeling positive about it and uh, doing what he loves to do best. So I guess he did touch upon kind of some of the more, uh, some of the dApps he's previously built. He mentioned in a tweet that maybe he'll go find some teams who may actively want to run some of the the dApps he've got, he's got shelved up. Do you know much more about that? Um. Uh, I, I do, but I, I don't want to um, uh, front run the news um, yeah, okay. um, and, cool. and, and, and talk about um, something that he doesn't want to be made uh, public right now. Um, cool. But I can say that um, the sort of like DeFi primitives or technology that he's been working on, and not just like DeFi technology, but other technologies, I mentioned like um, the zero knowledge proof technology, he's been working on that for quite a long time. It's quite advanced. Um, and I think like what he's looking to do is that when the new chain is launched, um, to do deploy that new technology and to get people really excited about it um and he you know he's obviously like one man now he's a very brilliant guy he's, he's super productive honestly like the most productive developer that i've ever seen in my life um oh. and I, i'm not saying that like lightly um but obviously like even him you know can't run four separate projects plus phantom plus everything else right so he obviously knows a lot of you know developers in the community a lot of competent developers He's obviously well uh, connected in the crypto and the blockchain community. So I'm sure he'll be able to find great teams and provide leadership for them to run these yeah. um, new projects that, that he has coming out. I, I've spoken about that before with regards to Andre Cronje. Like, that's the best way. When you've got somebody that's an innovator, what do, they need to do what they do best, which is innovate. They don't don't need to be stuck in the minutiae of being a CEO running a project. Like that's not what that's not where he fries. Yeah. He fries being yeah. innovative. That's creative. my job. That's my job. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You have to do these podcasts, and he needs to innovate in the back room somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. I mean, and I think that's ultimately what got to him in the last cycle was you know it's just it's too much of the forward facing kind of minutiae of running the projects when he just wanted to innovate and create the new exciting thing, and that entrepreneurial dev needs to be in that environment where they just make it. That's where they're best. That's where they thrive. Uh, so it's good to see him back where he's happy. That's that's a, that's a big thumbs up from us. Um, 
Okay, so I think that covers off that. The last point really I wanted to cover off is, actually, before I do this, how is Bernard Schultz getting on? Obviously, that was a big, big step in in bringing Bernard Schultz into the team. Can you speak a few moments about his how he's getting on uh, with Phantom? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he's the one that originally brought the idea and the vision and the leadership for, for Sonic and a whole bunch of de- developers that we onboarded um, came from his network. Um, I really like the technical teams that we have at the moment because they just kind of like run autonomously you know they just get stuff done there's not really much ego um and and bernard in particular is is a great individual to work with because not only is he like very technically brilliant you know as we talked about before he's a decades of experience in building virtual machine technology and building the technology that like exists with sonic nowadays but he's also just like a very like uh, personable guy that's just really easy to communicate with so bernard is very um upbeat uh, on the technical future, he's very happy with how the Sonic results have come out. Um, you know, wh- he was a little bit nervous about when it came to testing a few months ago, because obviously when you start testing stuff, you may uncover, you know, um, uh, not good things there. And, you know, there were some like bugs that were fixed here and there. Um, but overall, it was even like better than he initially expected, um, which makes him you know very, very happy with the progress at the moment. And he's also very excited um about this like new direction we're going in because he can kind of see the opportunity as me and andre explained it to him and he said you know that the sonic technology can really like work well uh for this bridging to ethereum or positioning it more of like an l2 so he's basically his role right now is just you know <laughs> continuing to work on the sonic technology make it applicable in the areas that we talked about and essentially growing the team so I think in the past like a couple of months, we've hired two additional people as part of his team, and he's searching for more and more developers uh, to add to the team just to accelerate the technology. But I talk to Bernard, you know, very often as well, several times a week. Um, I have fortnightly calls with him for like an hour, an hour and a half, and we just go over all the technical stuff. So um, it's 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 looking good. Nice, 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 nice. Okay, so let's talk about, before we wrap up here, I don't want, I'm just conscious of time with you here, Michael. Let's talk about stablecoins. Will Sonic see a Fantive, Phantom native stablecoin? Um, yes, it will. Um, we are also going to be announcing a canonical stablecoin for both um, the Opera network and the new network very, very soon. Um, we're going to have you know, multiple different stablecoins, not just... Um, you know, uh, the, the centralized stable coins that, that exist out there, but also um, ones that are like kind of more decentralized that are um, uh, based around, you know, collateralized debt positions or CDPs. Um, so definitely stable coins are extremely important. Uh, canonical stable coins and native stable coins are extremely important for a DeFi ecosystem because without it, there's always limited growth on the DeFi ecosystem. And that's the problem that we've been having for Phantom at the moment. You know, we have different like token standards for the same sort of stable coin it leads to issues like liquidity fragmentation. Um, it, it, it's difficult in order to um, acquire these stable coins. You have to jump through several hoops rather than just jumping through one hoop. Um, so we want to make the onboarding process as easy as possible by having canonical native stable coins there. And they are definitely coming and it definitely is one of our number one priorities. And again, just for the lay person, can you explain to them what, what you mean by canonical stable coin? So a canonical stablecoin is essentially like an official stablecoin from the network that's endorsed by the foundation. So, um, for example, like if a stablecoin is not canonical, we we wouldn't say, oh, you know, this is foundation endorsed. Everybody should use it. We'll just say that the stablecoin exists. But a canonical stablecoin will point to and say, yes, this is the in foundation endorsed stablecoin on the network. We encourage everybody to use it. We encourage everybody to um you know uh, we, we, and we would um actively get projects to to use that stablecoin etc just so we just have one standard that's out there for a particular stablecoin because it just makes it a lot easier in terms of the issues i talked about not having liquidity fragmentation having economies of scale etc but doesn't that create more responsibility for you as a foundation to collateralize it and to to secure it i mean if you look at other uh networks out there they don't necessarily have canonical do they are there examples good examples of canonical stable coins um yeah uh, other chains out there do have canonical stable coins for example like they might have 
native issuance of USDT, USDC, um, they would be considered like canonical stable coins on those right. chains. Um, so yes, like obviously there's a little bit more responsibility to say something is foundation endorsed and to publicly say that people should be using it. But I think it's necessary so people can very clearly understand, okay, if I'm a developer and I'm monitoring this network, which stable coin do I, do I add to my project? Oh, I'm going to go for this stable coin because that's the one that the foundation has publicly endorsed and has called it quote unquote canonical, right? Or official. And so it just makes it um, easier for projects to launch and it gives them clarity as to like, you know, what stable coin they, they should be adopting that's widely used across the network. And, and and that just makes DeFi activity a lot easier. Got it. And I know last time we spoke, it was quite a while ago, but we spoke about, you know, the, the idea that you may consider an over-collateralized stablecoin. Is that, would that still be the route you'd be looking to go? So it wouldn't be a stablecoin that's issued by the foundation. It would be okay. existing over-collateralized stablecoins. Um, there, there, there are a few names that are out there. There's already one that's committed to launching very early on on the new network. Um, can't give out names, unfortunately, but yeah, you know, we would encourage those, those, those projects that, um, specialize in printing over collateralized stable coins to also deploy in Phantom or awesome. the new network. Awesome, Michael. That pretty much wraps up everything. We're running for just over an hour there. And really exciting time. Really exciting. I love what you guys have been working on over at Sonic. Clearly, you guys have been busy in the bear market, as all great projects are. You know, do, do the building in the bear market and, and come out with the launches and the announcements in a bull market. Is there anything we've not covered off here that you'd like to kind of mention or share with the community? Um, no, I think we covered quite a lot. And again, I appreciate the opportunity. You bet. And hopefully we, if people want a deeper dive, they want to go into more of the technicals and some of the data and stats behind Sonic, uh, then do comment below and we can do a more scheduling, a more deep dive conversation, some of the technicals. I just wanted this to be a very high level breakdown um, around what is going on with Phantom, what's going on with the e existing network, what does Sonic mean, when is it going to be ready, what does it mean for your tokens? All those questions are being bombarded to me over the last kind of 24 to 36 hours, so hopefully this covers that off. Uh, if there are any further questions, then of course you guys can reach me in my Telegram, in the Discord as well, or on Twitter, and uh, obviously Michael's active on Twitter as well, so feel free to at him, and I'm sure he'll get back to you on any questions you have. Michael, thank you so much for your time today, appreciate it, buddy. Thanks, mate, really appreciate it as well. And I'll see you, everybody else, in the next one.